Welcome to Micro College. This week, we are really excited to have as our guest, Miles Eiten, aka Irie Givens. Um, Miles is an interdisciplinary educator and multimedia artist from Miami, Florida. After receiving his master's from, in creative industries design from the National Cheng Kong University in Taiwan, where he was there as part of the Fulbright program, he parlayed his thesis project into the hip hop English as a foreign language teaching startup, Lo-Fi Language Learning. And today he is a teacher of English language as a foreign language uh, training instructor and a career coach for students at Lo-Fi Arts and EFL program, currently hosted at the New College of Florida. As Irie Givens, his international recordings and ethereal concept albums can be found on most streaming platforms. And outside of curricula and multimedia production, he provides digital marketing services for like-minded organizations, expanding Lo-Fi's operations into a digital education firm. And you know, there's a lot of interesting things in that bio, Miles. Uh, but one of the things that we're interested in talking about today is um, you actually got in touch with us because you're working on a micro college yourself, the Lo-Fi uh, Language Learning Micro College, which which we'll be diving into and how you connected with that idea and uh, and the idea of micro colleges. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I got to do the obligatory hip hop shout outs to Miami, Tainan, Taiwan, and Denver, Colorado. We all out here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Miles is joining us from Denver. Um, yeah, so as you know, on podcasts, we like to root what we talk about in people's biographies. So if you can take us back uh, to where you were um, as you were as you were 18, 19, 20 years old, um, what were you doing? Where were you? Who was in your life? And and uh, how did that shape where you are now? Sure. Ooh, all the way back to like the start of adulting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 18, 19, I was first going to be a student at the University of Miami. That's where my mom works. And then I had a pretty much just come to the deity of your choice moment where I visited a New College of Florida in Sarasota and decided, hey, this this is actually the place for me. I'm going to do that instead because I would have been a deferred spring entry to the University of Miami. And what really got me is the idea of having a more tight-knit educational community, having some of that freedom to explore. I mean, for context, I went to a private Christian K-12 from like preschool to the end of middle school and I was like yeah we're not doing that no more and then went to the biggest public high school in Florida so it was just a big <laughs> contrast so I think seeing new college of Florida really helped me to kind of find where I like to be on that balance to say hey I still want to have a big community with some ideological freedom some good space for I don't want to say just debate or finding ideas and coming yeah. about like more into coming more into my adulthood which I think a lot more people want to do intentionally than we give yeah. um you know my generation and Gen Z credit for yeah. so new college new college of Florida is has been in the news recently um some people may have heard of it for the <laughs> first time and and maybe kind of yeah have no way to contact to place it but New, for a long time, New College of Florida has been, um, you know, one of the standout kind of experimental alternative, like interesting colleges in the country. So can you describe what it has been or what it was when you were there? What, what was distinctive about it? Sure. I was there from 2014 to 2018, and it was very much, I think, a classic liberal arts model for whatever's being said it wasn't right now. We had to go through a, oh, I got to turn my notifications off on my phone, hold on, let me ping in there. <laughs> it was very much a liberal arts curriculum in its spine. And then as you kind of move through the structure, you know, towards the heart of it, you have the opportunity to explore not just other classes that professors made for you, but this unique thing called tutorials where other students, other community members who are obviously vetted or sponsored by other faculty could lead courses that other students could take. So ideally, there was a system for students to teach other students. Mm -hmm. And it let me, that's kind of how I started on the founding of my venture, Lo-Fi Language Learning, was I was big into 
hip hop and writing. That was the bread and butter of my academic experience. So I started a tutorial with the classics department and my advisor, Dr. Carl Shaw, shout out, called Freestyle Tutorial, where we explored a lot of the intersections between the classic reconstructions of their epic poems and the very you know, troubadour nature of just walking around speaking it and the documented version we have being just this collection of community folk sharing of that story with how hip-hop evolved from this group dance activity in the states if we trace them back to cool herc uh down on cedric Ave in the bronx to then you know adding the mc then adding the message that comes with it and then essentially bringing that collectivist experience of eastern and africanized music into the western canon of you know an individualized hero's tale so it was these and other propaganda that they let us study what you do that <laughs> kind of led us down this path but no nah, all in all seriousness i think it gave me a love for kind of what the micro colleges that we're seeing now, like why I hit up Thoreau College is now because every university is in itself like a collection of colleges, right? And New College already being so small, there was only like maybe 800 or so students when I was there, already felt like a collection of micro colleges coming together to be one university experience. Yeah. Yeah, I know having been a high school, um, counselor and you know definitely new college was on my radar as a place that I'd mentioned to students. Um, I don't know if we had anyone go there, but certainly people applied and checked it out. Um, I mean, wasn't it the case that, it, that there was no there was no letter grades there? Is that right? That is right. It was a pass fail system. So you either got a sat satisfactory and your professor wrote about why that's the case and how deeply or an unsat and your professor again wrote about the case and why it was that deep or even if you got it incomplete. The professor would write, hey, here's what's left. So when we send our grades off to grad schools or to, um, I don't know, job applications, you might really care about it. It's cool because you really have to dig in deep and learn about the academic experience as tightly as we had to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that stood out. You know, our, our high school also didn't have letter grades. And so I was, as a counselor, always having to explain <laughs> to different people, including the colleges, you know, how the you know, this narrative evaluation system worked and things like that. So it was, there's a hand, there's a, there's two or three other universities or colleges that don't have letter grades and, and, and new college is one of them. So I think to me that, that just goes to, you know, to do that, you have to be attentive to the individual, right? You have to be small enough to, to take the time to, to, to give a qualitative evaluation rather than run someone through an algorithm. And that's as classic as it gets to me, you know what I mean? We've systematized grades in itself to make it easy to categorize getting someone from point A to point B. But here it's like, no, ask the question. How well did you do in this course? You know, take the time, read it through, figure that all out. So that was another piece that, you know, don't get me wrong. Every now and again, it might have like grinded my last nerve when I'm actually in it. And I'm like, yo, the way my scholarship money set up, and this Pell Grant tell me if I'm making it or not. But yeah. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, once we got past that, I'm really grateful to have had that experience. <laughs> cool. So there, there is a classic, I think, uh, you know, an impact of an alternative educational system, right? You, what you described there, that bringing together the the you know the Western hero stories and hip hop and other forms of music, and and you know the opportunity to synthesize something like that. That that you can see that playing out in all of the other things that you've done, right? That's. If, if what I read from you is is a lot of a lot of bringing together different strands and ideas, which is super exciting. Um, um, so take it from there. You how how did you end up going to Taiwan? So my last year, I was spending my time in college, just kind of enamored doing everything. Like I was just you know a boy from South Florida. So when you're like, especially in a small college, oh, you could take on this role in your like local organizing efforts in the city or even in your student government? I said yes to all of them. Um, I was applying and got a Fulbright to Taiwan National Tunggung University for creative industries design, which like I never heard of. I'm sure most people listening right now I never heard of either, but <laughs> it's a thing, <laughs> right? And it made sense to me because uh, a lot of what I was doing was experience and learning designing if you think about it like I made this tutorial that I was running with students and my advisor but I was also doing 
just hip hop in and out the city. When we threw parties at the college, I was like, all right, let's try to get performers together, folks from my class or who aren't in my class, and make something happen. I know we're a small city, but you know, let's build this this ecosystem. We threw a show even out um in a couple like the Ringling Museum, for example, let us come in and do a little freestyle session. Um, there was one day where this is for folks who do music. One of my buddies was like, hey, let's do a, um, there's these people who said we can sign on to this tour and perform like with KRS-One at this bar. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna pay somebody else to do that. Why don't we just go talk to the bar man and say, yo, let's do the splits. We can bring you the students, give us our own show. And things like that were happening. So I think it fit for my academic journey to try design who I couldn't even really draw. I was just doing multimedia all over the place, music, film, and building around that. And I only had like a year of China, uh, Chinese on me when I realized, oh, I'm going to apply to this grant. And for some reason, Fulbright's like, oh, if you want to Taiwan, you don't need to learn English. And I'm like, cool if you're going to the capital of Taipei. My grant was in the South. Wow. So I, I was just down for the challenge. <laughs> So you needed to you needed to, to to ramp up your own language skills there in a new language pretty quick. Yeah, and you know what? I was from Miami, Florida, and mind you, 18 years there, I could not speak Spanish beyond like, <laughs> yo, where's the bathroom? This is what I do and do not eat. And that's wild to me, right? Because I think that speaks to kind of like you were talking about like uniting the academic experience before, right? That speaks a lot to how even in as diverse a place as Miami. Those offerings were not always there. And that's kind of wild that like, yeah. I'm not saying everyone should be speaking Spanish there, but it's like, I now speak more Chinese than Spanish. Like something happened there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, it sounds like a real, you know, another uh, language and cultural immersion, right? In, in, a, in a new, you know, yeah, very, very different sort of place when you grow up. And uh, yeah, so what was that like? It was amazing honestly it was like i always use the the analogy like if anyone's a fan of the last airbender the cartoon we're off with the movie there was that part where avatar ang had to go to turtle island to just kind of like right before the big final battle of his life he just needs to sit down meditate get his skills together and do that and that's what being on that journey was like um i really got to sharpen up skills that i didn't even know I thought I would need. So being immersed in a whole different language, kind of regressing to being a very grown second grader in that sense. Like I could just <laughs> communicate very basic things. And from there, you have to step it up. And I think what I like the most about that experience was, I, I don't know, in the States, I was very much in this identity. Of, oh, okay. Like you, like you being where you are, black as you are, and you get good grades, like, nah, you got to do X, Y, and Z. It really kind of, like, show out for the culture. Ain't it, well, no one was really looking at me like that in that sense in Taiwan. So I was like, yeah, I can go during the day and be in grad school and do all the things. But at night, it's like I was rolling out to the club. I was getting my DJ and rapping gigs in there. And I was making my community that way. And I probably learned more Mandarin doing that, integrated with those folks, than when I was... I don't want to say actually in class, but probably doing more of the traditional ways of learning that. And even more interesting was like those DJs and artists that I ran into knew how to speak better English than some of the folks in my actual English language program, if only because like it was just more relevant to their day to day. So it also that that whole experience also validated to me the idea that like, you know, the culture pushes us forward so i should feel comfortable to follow how i want to engage in the culture and i say that with like with quotes for you no know what i really mean when i say the culture yeah yeah um so i think that 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 makes me um want to think uh, stop there a moment and maybe even rewind a little bit so as we can see um as i see from your story as we can hear you know the through line one of the through lines in what you're doing is language, there's cultural exploration, but through it all, there's hip hop, right? And, and music, right? And I think that, that um, you know, you're, you know, seems like something that you were doing all along the way. And as you're saying, it's a way that you're connecting with people in this, on the other side of the world, right? In this, in this very, you know, very different place. Um, you know, I could say I'm, 
I'm very ignorant person when it comes to, to hip hop history and culture, but even I know, like I, um, I went to college for two years in Eastern Europe, um, traveled, you know, you know, widely in that region. And um, I can say that, that, you know, among the different languages out there, like the language of hip hop is one of the universal ones there. It, it touches something in, in, in the youth and in cultures around the world in a way that that's powerful. And I think my sense is that that that's part of what you're, you're digging into with your projects. Right. What can you say a bit more? Like, how did you get into into DJing and hip hop, and 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 what is it that that speaks transnationally, internationally, cross culturally like that? For sure. I mean, it. I like that story. Uh, how and I know there's probably a form of term for this, but God forgive me. You know when they say like the first monkey washed a coconut in the beach sand, and then another one in a completely remote location that had no idea. This is the thing, starts doing it, and it's like this group thing to where everybody realizes, oh, this is really a thing you can do. I see hip hop having evolved in that same sense where you know first comes jazz and everybody's improvising with their instruments and making that language go. And then folks step in and realize once commercial commercialization comes and makes that a different thing, you don't need really nothing to make the music, but like the voice that was scatting and maybe a hand or something to play the music, whether you're banging on the drums or you're on the DJ and you're doing all the ones and twos, that's really all it takes to like truly make music and there's no need to gatekeep people from doing that. So I, I think took a lot of that application from being in the academic and just life situations I was in growing up. I had the opportunity to go to this, you know, private Christian button your shirt all the way up K-12. But when I came home, my neighborhood didn't look like that. That was a lot to try to figure out as a kid. And the through line for me there was, oh, a lot of the writing and rhetorical skills that we're learning about, like, quote, unquote, proper English, that all is something I could also relate to the culture that hits me back when I, like, get home in this, like, studio or one bedroom apartment and explore through hip hop. So all in all, when I was moving through university, New College again gave us the opportunity to say, hey, you explore academically, but you want to explore, we want to make sure that you just have the basis to do that really intelligently, for lack of a better word. So that's where I really grounded my studies into using freestyle tutorial to build into, I was a philosophy student. so. I build into a lot of the philosophy of music and like standpoint epistemology to write a thesis on how hip hop relates to just the racial epistemologies and know-how of America. So that by the time I'm ready to go to Taiwan and study design in this sense, creative industry design, and I'm seeing hip hop take a completely different shape outside of those racial and class dynamics that I was used to seeing it in, mm-hmm. I then explored how is hip hop and larger picture hip hop culture shaping the English culture that's now taking place in Taiwan, thanks to the education system having this blueprint where by 2030 they want Taiwan to be a quote unquote English speaking country. So basically let it be their official language in a sense. Because most young generation Taiwanese students are taking English lessons, both in class and out of class, and the what they call the bushi bond or cram school system. Mm-hmm. It's just how, much, how well are they going to retain that if they don't actually use it? One of the ways they are actually using it is when they're hopping on line and engaging in hip hop culture. So that's where the connection all comes in for me. So that when um, I had the opportunity to join this business pitch competition, it was the Be Young Beyond startup pitch competition at the National Taiwan University of Science and Technology. I really want to explore how can we infiltrate the idea of quote unquote proper English or like what they call native speakerism in ESL and EFL. This idea that you have to sound like this up north Yankee foreigner to be doing English properly to say, nah, you just need to know how to communicate <laughs> with us. And I found a way to do that through hip hop. We pitched the idea as a series of workshops, got first place, woohoo. And then I think it took so much more shape from there. And without jumping ahead of your questions, there's definitely a something, something, something micro college, but yeah, this is where it all started. 
<laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is. It's it's a uh, it's a fascinating idea. I think if you look at yeah that that button down proper you know Yankee English like that's one end of the spectrum, and this hip hop culture English is like it's like the particle particle accelerator you know Adam Smasher like version of where you can see new words being generated every day and coming into American English and global language out of that culture. So it seems like it's weird. It's, it's, a, it's the lively end of, of language development. So um, yeah, say more about, you've you really, you've created here a, a method, a new method of teaching language that is incorporating this, this culture. Like, how does that work? So at first um, we got into teaching students directly using what I call the the Ivory Miyagi method, which was some fancy words I made up to say, like, like Mr. Miyagi moving the, the paintbrush. You don't know you're doing it until you're doing it. Which was, if you take what we call the five pillars of hip hop, that breaks down into MCing, rapping, breaking, breakdancing, DJing, art, graffiti art, and then the knowledge. So, like, you know, the epistemology that wraps all that up and root that into. Um, you know, what we do in hip hop culture where we make media, you can intersect your lesson planning with what they call the four major language skills, reading, writing, speaking, listening. Mm. And that when I was creating curric a bunch of curricula for sixth graders in Taiwan to use school, but then I realized, why don't we try to teach other teachers to also, you know, start from this framework and use this mindset. And from there, we pivoted from being this direct to student model of, hey, we have to teach kids to, you know, essentially like hip hop to get this, which isn't always the case, just to be honest. And we can instead teach teachers who have some kind of grounding in like an art form that they love to fall back on their own culture using, you know, the same pillar structure, even if it's not necessarily hip hop. Um, we had the opportunity to teach. We got a grant during the pandemic, the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund, to do like a rapid response to offer students at New College of Florida and um, in the surrounding really global community, there was an online class, a chance to take this course towards a EFL certification. And that really kicked off um, where we're going now to try to build a whole micro college out of it and give them an experience abroad that we're facilitating all the way through. Obviously, a lot has happened at New College of Florida since then, so that class is not, not there right now anymore, but I think it, you know, I'm so grateful for the foundation of ha letting this idea evolve from, hey, you know, kind of the stereotype of, you can use hip hop to teach anything and that'll reach underprivileged kids more to, nah, you can look at like the real of it, the ideation and the futuristic thinking that goes into hip hop style of creativity and apply that to just break down the prescriptivism of language teaching entirely and just let people be functional in the language that they're teaching or speaking. Yeah. That, that's one, one question that comes to me is that you, when you think about you know, teaching English, let's say a place like Taiwan, or and maybe it, you know it's a stereotype that I'm carrying, but I think my sense would be that that would be the the pre prescriptivist kind of extreme right that they there's there's a desire to get you know to pass certain like exam standards and things like that in which case like like specific kind of standards st uh, language standards would be important and i'm wondering how how does that the method that you're bringing interact with that um that need to fit into an existing educational grid right and that's a question i get asked a lot especially when i was over there like you know they will pass the test <laughs> And my answer is, first of all, pronunciation and knowing the difference between inflections comes a lot more with actually caring about how what you're saying that. That matters a lot more when your pedagogy is mixed into, hey, I gotta put this to a beat. I need to know how to differentiate between you all and y'all in whatever context. Mm -hmm. So it's really baking into the activities, the fundamentals of the thing. Um, I also think about how Taiwan system is structured right now to where like, yo, they doing school school. Like <laughs> you going to sit in your day in your day class, then you leave for another how many hours to sit in the Bushi Bon and Cram school, 
all trying to layer English onto you when like it's almost completely, you know, for lack of a better word, artificial. Like there was a government mandate that just decided, yo, we're speaking English now. We're gonna be an English speaking culture. <laughs> right? That's crazy. Which, like, yeah. makes, <laughs> Geopolitically, it makes sense, like right. for where Taiwan is in the world, like you can be China, you can be United States. I get that, but then for the English culture that does come in as a result of that, like all the new teachers that get hired, all of the um, I don't know American journey people who come to Taiwan and set up shop here because of that, or not even just American English speaking, I should say, there now has a, a bit of a separation of the culture on the island between like people doing just strictly English things and then people who are doing strictly Mandarin things. And I think hip hop helps bridge that gap yeah. to not only like give you a reason to care because maybe you don't even care about hip hop, but give you a real life context as to where this can go down besides the boardroom. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, I mean, just I think thinking about what language is and how it works and inflection and, and you know, connotation, denotation, all those things, it, it seems really really natural um but i also yeah so maybe maybe we can go ahead now to talk about the micro college idea and um i mean first of all um yeah so this 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 idea uh you know the word micro college um maybe um i mean you you heard about this in the context of of a of another college is that right yes um so i'm currently working with some folks in denver shout out to moonshot adventures Mm -hmm. And it helped me get a sense of where I want to take the venture moving forward. And, you know, just researching some models around, I found, and I remember when we spoke about this off camera, I said this college was going wrong, but I got it now. It was Bennett College, which was an HBCU, I believe either an all women's or just like mostly women HBCU, that had to find a model to pivot to better serve their students. And they were also a small group. And they said, yeah, we're, well, we're now a micro college. And it, you know, struck me as interesting because I'm like, what does that necessarily mean? <laughs> and then I did more research and so I came and found a place like Thoreau College. And I was like, oh, I got to reach out because I found it interesting what a lot of like these micro colleges are doing to where when you think about what a school is and should be, probably way back when this would have just been called like a school unit when it wasn't so much worried about, you know, recruiting to meet this specific number because we have to match funding this way or um, trying to make sure the pipeline goes specifically toward this way is how do we impart life skills into the students that we're facilitating here um, it seems weird even to think like oh what's the intersection between a place like Thoreau College and what after what I just described a little fi language learning wants to do and I'm thinking I would have loved an urban iteration of say the Driftless Folk School, yeah. where I was at to say like, oh, I like hip hop, but would someone be down to like sit and teach me the actual, let's say technical skills of putting a beat together or what I need to record something from just a microphone into the computer and what does it mean for me to like mix versus master my stuff and then even break down into the theory of it so like you want to do music how in what context why like it's not just as simple as you make a song you just became Beyonce like what's your marketing strategy like who are you talking to those kinds of things that I in what I've been researching about micro colleges it seems like there's a lot more freedom for the students who are going through this experience together to help shape that direction of learning that's yes. A tenant I found important in my experience at New College of Florida, 2014 to 18, that I would love to bring to a more micro college package of what lo fi language learning does. So I'm imagining a scenario where we put folks through our EFL certification course, like I mentioned, then we give them the opportunity to put that to use, take them all to Taiwan and fund their own, they're on their own fully adulting path of using that certification teaching because the demand's pretty high already for English language there while integrating their arts in kind of the coursework we laid out. But while they're there, also giving them the opportunity to be in the cohort learning experience grounded in the liberal arts. So we're all working together towards one big collaboration art project. So you know you still have the opportunity to work towards the art that you're truly trying to pursue. 
And then while we're there, we mix in some of the classes that, you know, a lot of people are, I think, only realize the value of in a college experience after going through it because before it's like, does it make money? But I think it's so valuable for someone to really sit down and like consider the Cartesian medication, uh, meditation or like wonder about Plato's forms while you're com doing something completely separate to what your line of stuff, that line of study is and find ways of integrating it. Like everyone deserves to like put that time towards serious philosophical inquiry. And I think being in a completely different language environment where yes, you wanna make sure they're learning the local language too, but in this small cohort, when they are using English together, like they get real deep into it. I think that's the kind of intensity of experience that I'd like to help educate. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I I love that that uh, you know that the liberal arts th thread of what you're doing. I love the fact that you drop the word uh, epistemology, like you do, because <laughs> that that's a, that's one that's one of my favorite words. And uh, I think it's you can't really have a have a a strong model of education unless you have considered your epistemology and your and your you know your standards for truth and and for communication. Um, but uh, yeah, about I mean, so maybe back a couple of steps. I mean, Bennett College um, as you know the serendipity of the of the universe is this morning showed up in my email. <laughs> Look at God. Um, and as you know, as you might imagine, I've got a, a Google News like like tab for things that are micro college and versions of that. And today, I'd never heard of it except for from you, and it popped up today. And um, it's a great example. I mean, uh, so um, we've got listeners all over the world. They might not know what an HBCU is. This is a historically black college or university. In this case, this is a women's college in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and, uh, sounds like about 200 students or so right now. And, you know, like a lot of small colleges, HBCUs and otherwise, like this is a hard time for, for these, you know, for legacy private colleges. Um, and one of the strategies that, that they've picked up there is to, to go with it, to say, we're going to be small and, 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 uh, really talk about what are the virtues of being small and, and individually oriented. So, um, yeah, I really appreciated, uh, knowing about that even before it showed up, <laughs> I think we found out where to sign up to the same newsletter, but where? <laughs> yeah, Google News search. It'll, it'll, it'll pick it up. Um, but the other thing is, yeah, so you're you're saying about, you know, folk school in an urban environment or, or, or a, you know, micro college that's addressing some of the, the kind of skills and, and perspectives that you're working on. Um, that's a question that comes to me quite a lot is, you know, so a lot of the are, you know, the folks we've interviewed on this podcast, for example, they're running projects that are in the wilderness. They're on a farm, they're off in an island off of Alaska, things like that. And so th the question naturally is that this is, can this only happen in a remote like wilderness place or in a, a rural place? Um, could this happen in an urban environment? Um, and I certainly would like to to think so, right? I think that, the, that you know, they're, you know, all aspects really, including ones that are focused on growing food and doing things with your hands, right? There's there's incredible urban agriculture going on and um, there there's folk arts of all kinds all over the world. So um I, I really love that that you're asking this question and and uh you know and and exploring what this idea could look like with, with some a few different variables. Um, For sure. I mean to cite a great researcher in the field, I had learned from I think we're gonna use it as a J hint. Just what the components of a micro college were. When I mean, just being honest, you let me know. Like we're trying to break it down to something that's human scale, so small, having a holistic curricula, excuse me, being meaning centered, either spiritual or just purpose focused, and then the big one, place based. I don't see that as needing to be a remote place. It could be a place within a place. Why not? Let's carve a circle out in the city for us. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that you know, what I hear you also talking about is, you know, one way to learn about place is also to 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 go to a different place. Like I think the idea, especially learning about language in a like a, a new language environment, um is 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 yeah, that's that that's a great place to be thinking about epistemology and about what words really mean and, and what are the you know different kind of levels of meaning. Yeah, and I mean to ground it and keep it real too outside of like you know, all these like four syllable philosophical terms I feel like I gotta use to <laughs> break it down. There's also just the idea like, yo, who can and can do hip hop, right? And I think the place based feature of it was something that struck me. So when I was in Taiwan and I'm catching like, you know, folks 
rocking the Jeremy Lin locks, like doing full on dance hall routines, or like going to the club and they playing like Taiwan hit Afro beats before us in the U.S. I just want to point that out there. Like we were slow to that as a culture, but like even just watching this culture take shape outside of the sure. black and brown folks who I see use it. I feel like a lot of times being in an American context, we want to like really I don't want to say gatekeep, but put our guards up because of the history of what happens with like jazz or like we just watch the Elvis movie you knowing like all right someone else gonna get paid for this and then it's like yeah it's completely out of these folks' hands. But I actually think there's something like really magical about watching like I used to talk about an example before. The mediums of this culture take shape elsewhere and then have those folks also look back and realize like, yo, okay, but we recognize it came from this. In a lot of ways, this is how like we know of places in America where black and brown people are innovating like this, not just culturally, but even like this grounds a lot of our tech innovation. Like you don't get an iPod if people wasn't trying to listen to like the Michael Jacksons and the two pops of the world before that. You know what I mean? So and I think a place too, as it relates to this project, a lot of what I want to help show my target audience is that you like the principle of hip hop is you claim the space, you make the space, like you draw your circle in the sand and you spit your cipher right there and fight all who are welcome to come do the thing. It is truly like life is truly your mixtape to make a mix. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about who you're who you're imagining your students to be, or like who's the target or the the kind of the demographic. And um, I think one thing that that seems to be uh, coming up in your is this just is this targeted towards men specifically? Yeah, that's actually a pretty new development because um, to keep it real, every time I've done like trials of this before, I was doing a teacher training. Whenever I was doing it with students, a big thing that always popped up was, and this is, I guess, you know, you got to draw it up to the nature of hip hop as the commercialization of the culture has pushed it out. Um, in all the demoing I've done in the course that I was workshopping with like students more than teacher trainers or teach trainees, I should say, it was pretty difficult to try to cultivate a space where every woman felt as comfortable as every man to engage as deeply because. You start freestyling or you tell someone, hey, just start going off the cuff about what it is you're rhyming about. It's pretty easy for a dude to just hop out and be like, you know, my big dick this or like balls that, that kind of thing. And, you know, I had guardrails around like, hey, say like, please refrain from using X, Y, Z words. Not that I'm going to like stop sense you tell you you can't, but it's just like if someone tries to fight with you about that, I'm going to sit there and let it happen because I told y'all to like, you know, mind your space, you're sharing it. Still, you invite the space for that conflict to have to take place in the first place, and that still puts the onus on someone else to come and, you know, start that confrontation. So a lot of what I was thinking about as I'm like, as I read like feedback from Freestyle Tutorial, for example, when I was an undergrad teaching my undergrads, was a lot of like male students being like, hey, especially like in a liberal arts setting where like, you know, just there's a lot going on in the zeitgeist for men to feel just like what do I do in this you know new role for me where they're like I appreciate having this space to like be yes be unfiltered but at the same time be guided based off of you know what I said and how like how what I say matters but still having the space to say what I need to say and you know just get my like get it off my chest there so I felt like as I went into teacher training that same dynamic wasn't always present, but I thought as I'm thinking about building specifically towards the human aspect of it, like how do we build towards just non-marketable traits, just, you know, being human-centered, making good humans. Mm -hmm. Men in college are having this crisis to where that just seems so impossible for them. Mm -hmm. So this could truly be a space to help, like, I think, also show that higher education does still have a place for helping you know this subset of men reach i don't want to say you know manhood like my one program could do all that but at least another step in comfort that like what they have to offer the creative world 
as a man, especially like black and brown men, is really out there for him mm-hmm. in a higher fascinating. education model. That's fascinating because uh, uh, my own experience as a student in micro college was in an all male environment. Um, oh, word. So that was a Deep Springs College, um, which is key inspiration for this, was was all male for about exactly 100 years from its founding in 1917 down to 2018, um, and including when I was there in the late 90s. Um, and it was not something I went out looking for, like an all men's experience. Um, I had no like concept or experience of that before. And you know, I found it to be really, really rich. Um, and and now I've you know we've had uh, lots of interactions with women who have been at Deep Springs now, and I think you know that's also something beautiful and excellent that's happening there. Um, but but I think you know that especially the the you know all male educational spaces are increasingly rare. Like there 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 are very very few ones. And as you're saying, a lot of lot of young men, you know, uh, I think from all backgrounds, including black and brown, but but everyone really is it's it's a it's a tough time, and um, I think it's worthwhile our, our whole culture thinking about ways to to meet that challenge. That's real. Like it's not gonna get better. I think by not acknowledging that. I, like I'm well aware, and I want to like really put that front and center that like for the longest time, you know, these institutions were set up exclusively for men to succeed, right? Mm-hmm. And just because we're now seeing the balance shift to where hey men are you know not doing so hot here it's not that you know that in itself needs to just jump and be overcorrected as much as i don't think the answer is to divest entirely yeah That's I, bit. as you're saying i think that you know that one of the, the potentialities or one of the opportunities i think with a micro college um field right not just one or two individual micro colleges but a field is this sort of maximal diversification, right? There's place there for for all sorts of different spaces, all male, all women, mixed, you know, different, different kind of uh, academic or like practical focuses, things like that, that 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 really allow people to find the right place, you know, for for their their moment. So I think it was really interesting to see that. That that's there's not many people out there starting all male <laughs> projects right now, I would say. Even in like religious spaces, like you find very conservative Christian organizations, they're not starting all men's colleges for the most part. Like that's, it's pretty, pretty unusual. Yeah, anytime we think of all male anything right now, I feel like it's some group on Reddit that probably shouldn't be doing what they're doing. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what, we, we should probably reverse course here, y'all. <laughs> yeah. So how do you have a vision? I mean, this, 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 you know, the, the, the humanities, the whole kind of human being, you know, focus that you were, you know, you're building into it. Like, you, you say more about that like what um you know what do you what do you hope people who come through this experience are like afterwards you know in addition to their their technical skills their artistic kind of abilities um what are they like as 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 people what are the qualities you hope they have um one thing i think i really want to help build in is an entrepreneurial mindset that doesn't take four years in a traditional program to cultivate to let folks know hey like these artists that you we're really enamored with seeing it started from an entrepreneurial grind. It's, you know, David Banner making and selling music out his trunk, Master P becoming a millionaire, just full indie, or Kanye's famous, like five beats a day for three summers. I I'm not gonna lie, you forget Kanye was quote unquote canceled. So I don't know if that's gonna make it in there for y'all, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes. But yeah, um, entrepreneurial mindset for one. We try to say with the grand vision we have for this micro college structure, shout out to Mushad Adventures again, it's you can either transfer into the university experience, a traditional four year, start your own entrepreneurial teaching or just music venture and, you know, rely on some supporting materials that we have as lo-fi the organization or stay where you are since the program will be taking place abroad and remain in the position that you are already in teaching as a teaching artist and growing there, you know, education is a field that could really use some of these talents. So I think that actually transitions to speaking a lot less about what you were saying, the human part, and more about just like tangible pieces. So as a human, on a human level, I really want to explore the idea that inclusivity can be anywhere. Like at the end of the day, rapping is dropping your rhymes straight from the heart to the mouth. And we know where it came from. Shout out to the 
the black and brown communities where it came from that being said it's gone places and i think having an international lens to it really brings to mind this idea that the creative freedom is something that's needed across cultures across dynamics across i think really any separation of peoples we could find so let's build that into our adults so that we can make better systems that recognize that applying creativity in all parts of life is so much more important than any other metric we use to define success hmm. beautiful yeah so maybe you can what, what's the what's the timeline here so you're you're there in denver you're you're engaged with moonshots adventures you know where you know where are you now in this process and and, and what what's next so I'm currently a fellow in the Cultivate stage at Moonshot Adventures. Um, the rest of the program would then lead to some further residencies that would probably take another year. But I know, you know, that's up to their, first of all, scheduling and programming. Second of all, if I make it all the way through. So that's an early, hey, I'm already doing media. Let me do my... <laughs> but nah, um, I would also like to have the opportunity to really... Um, keep workshopping and piloting as I'm doing through events here in Denver and explore more through the community. Like, hey, what is it y'all as artists are seeking on the ground? Like, um, how do you want to apply your skills to the current workforce? What is it you're seeking in an institutionalized educational structure that we can integrate for you? And hopefully I'd like to think by like, let's say 25, 2025, we have a very firm programmatic idea for us moving someone through that entire foreign exchange experience. Fingers crossed. Cool. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, great. Well, that I wish you just the best luck with that. And uh, yeah, I really have enjoyed, uh, you know, here learning about this this idea and about you know about the way that you've approached things. Um, and I really be, be looking forward to seeing what comes of it. So thanks for reaching out. Of course, of course. Thanks for having me and hosting me on and for negative, inevitably pushing these links that I'm going to send you after this to get folks into what we need to get them into. We got some pilots going on in Denver. Catch us on March 25th. A little business cipher circle for all of our entrepreneurial creatives going on in the city. We also are fundraising towards a curricular book, children's book project oh, wow. coming out so that we can, you know, let... Even the youngins know, once you start rhyming, you're in good timing. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Great. Yeah. Send those along and we'll, we'll, we'll share them all over with, with this, with this video, with, with this uh, podcast. So yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate y'all.